<clears throat> now I want to talk about active transport. Active transport occurs when the cell needs to move something into or out of the cell, but it needs to move it against its concentration gradient. So in other words, diffusion is not going to help us out here. If this is an ion, the cell wants to move an ion into the cell, but there's already a high concentration there. It's going to have to do work. It's not going to have to expend energy in order to, to accomplish this. So um, one way it can do it, one way active transport can occur is through a pump. And here's an example of that. So let's imagine we have a cell membrane here. This is the inside of the cell. This is the outside of the cell. And on the outside of the cell, we have a bunch of sodium. That's a black. A bunch of sodium ions in black. And then on the inside, we just have, you know, a little bit. Just a few sodium ions. But on the inside, we have a lot of red dots. Those represent potassium ions. And then on the outside, we just have a few potassium ions. All right, red is potassium. But the cell, believe it or not, it wants more sodium ions to leave the inside of the cell, and it wants more potassium ions on the inside of the cell. That's exactly the opposite of what these two ions are going to want to do um, through diffusion. So in order to do, accomplish this, to get these few sodium ions on the other side where it's already crowded, we need a pump. And the specific pump that accomplishes this is the sodium-potassium pump. It's a protein that hangs out in the membrane, kind of looks like this, big old protein. <clears throat> and first thing this protein will do is it'll bind onto a molecule of ATP. So this guy, is that's ATP. Think of ATP as the universal battery, okay? It's an adenine group bonded to three phosphates. So you got your adenine and you got your three phosphate groups bonded onto that. And this bond that connects the last two phosphate groups here is really high in energy. And when that bond's broken, it's going to release all that energy, and the cell can, just can harness it to change the shape of a protein or do whatever it needs to do. In this case, we're going to get a, a molecule of ATP that's going to bind right onto that protein, that pump protein. Meanwhile, you're going to get three sodium ions that bond right into these little, this little, these bonding sites right here on this side of the protein. When those sodium ions go in there and bind to those locations, it causes that ATP molecule to um, hydrolyze. So that breaks that third bond, boom, ATP now turns into ADP plus that phosphorus group, which is still hanging out there. That release of energy causes this protein to change shape. So now this protein absorbs all that energy, causes it to change shape, and now it looks something like this. So now, the sodium ions are on the other side of the membrane, and they're released, and they go to the outside. And that's how we were able to kind of accomplish moving the sodium ions from a low concentration to a high concentration. Okay. But now, okay, so it releases these guys. Remember, this phosphate group from the ATP is still hanging out right there. <clears throat> and then what happens is you'll get a few of these potassium ions that are hanging out on this side. They'll bind right in there. And when they bind on this side, that causes this potassium group to fall off. And now the protein assumes its original shape, just clunks back. You know, simply the, the fact that these potassium ions bounded right here to these binding sites, they have a charge, right? When they snuck in here, that caused these charges to rearrange. The phosphate group snaps off, and now those potassium ions are on this side, and they go to the inside. So by consuming one molecule of ATP, we're able to move three sodium ions from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell, and two potassium ions from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. That's against their concentration gradient, and, and it 
requires energy. Okay, so that's one way that things can move. You know, it's one pumps are one example of active transport. A second example is called vesicular transport. <clears throat> vesicular transport occurs when the cell membrane itself engulfs a particle bringing it into the inside of the cell or it releases particles through vesicles. We'll talk about the first example. Um, so this is, the first example of this would be exocytosis. Exo, write that better. All right, the first example of this is exocytosis. So here we have the side of a cell. We have the cell membrane. And on the inside, we have a sphere tiny little sphere. I'm drawing it like a circle, but it's really like a three-dimensional sphere. And it's made out of the same cell membrane that, in, that encases the whole cell. Okay. Now, <clears throat> this sphere it has a name. It's called a vesicle. They're tiny. They're probably like 30 nanometers in diameter, which means you would have to line up 30,000 of them end to end before you got a millimeter. So they're tiny, and they might contain a bunch of little chemicals. You know, they'll probably, a lot of times they'll contain neurotransmitters like serotonin or acetylcholine or something. So they contain these little, you know, chemicals. And what happens is, if, if the cell wants to release these chemicals into that extracellular space, all it does is it just brings this vesicle in close proximity to the, to the cell membrane. Now remember, this vesicle is made out of the same cell membrane constituents that this guy is. So it's a bunch of, you know, a bunch of phospholipids. And remember, we talked about it in class. These behave just like a film of soap, just like a bubble. If you put two bubbles together, those bubbles are going to, they're going to fuse. They're going to pop together until you get something that looks like this. And I'll kind of draw it down here. Now the bubble kind of looks like that. It just fuses with the side of the cell membrane, like two layers of bubbles popping together. And what that does is it releases all of those little particles, those neurotransmitters, into the extracellular space. That's exocytosis. Another example of vesicular transport is when the cell brings things in. We'll draw that down here. So let's say we have the end of a cell you know, or the side of a cell. And let's say that there's some particle, I don't know, out here. This could be, let's say this is a lysosome too. This cell right here is a lysosome, which is responsible for kind of cleaning up and digesting foreign things that might be in the extracellular space in the body. And let's say this is some nasty, I don't know, like particle of debris. You know, let's say this is part of a splinter or something that got into your finger, and this is a lysosome that wants to take care of that nasty thing that shouldn't be there. Well, what it'll do is this cell membrane will actually reshape and start engulfing that little particle. I'll erase that. So the cell membrane starts taking shape. It keeps kind of moving around. This takes energy. You've got little microtubules on the inside of the cell membrane that are causing this, this shape change. Okay, so the cell membrane starts to engulf it until finally it completely engulfs it and pinches it. And just like in this situation, when you have two bubbles that come together, those will fuse until you get a cell with a vesicle inside that cell that contains that big nasty particle. Now the lysosome can, you know, inject all of these digestive enzymes into that vesicle and destroy that thing and break it down so it's not a problem. That's called phagocytosis. <clears throat>